Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here to talk about another in our ongoing series of the world's worst composers. The first, as I mentioned, was Kurt Graunke, that fabulous German composer of no ability or talent whatsoever. One, none, zero, zippo, nothing. But this one was a little bit more famous, and he's gone, and as I say, hopefully forgotten. I am talking about John Tavener. Remember him? John Tavener was a English composer who died actually fairly recently. Um, within, let's see, what are his dates here? Let's let's be exact, shall we? I mean, because it always helps if we're as specific as possible. Uh, he was not actually all that old when he died. He had health issues. And as always in these cases, I don't wish anybody ill. I really don't. I may wish their music ill. That's a different question, I think, you know. But the person, no. They should have long and happy lives, and everything should be wonderful. But in this particular case, up ah, 2013. He passed away in 2013. And what I find remarkable about him is that we've he was such a flavor of the month. He was huge. He was huge because they selected his little choral work, the Song for Athene, to be performed at Diana's funeral. It was the recessional in Princess Diana's funeral. And boy, did that get him going. Before then, he was known in sort of the classical music ghetto. But then his music just exploded. That little choral work, that little five minute, it was like the Allegri Miserere of the, of the 20th century, the late 20th century or whatever that thing was. And I really, it really was astonishing. And let's not kid ourselves. The guy could write an attractive little, little choral work on a sacred text. That's what he did. And it was fine. But his larger stuff, his more ambitious stuff, oh my God, it was beyond horrible. Just horrible. A lot of things were called like veils. There was the protecting veil and the veil of the temple. He was kind of like Arvo Part with no talent. You know, he had this this he, he was he was Greek Orthodox and he had this spiritual advisor named Mother Hubbard. I mean I'm sorry, Mother Thecla. I mean, might as well have been Mother Hubbard. And and she told him what to do. And, you know, he consulted her for his spiritual texts based on Greek orthodoxy. And when he wore that out, he sort of de-orthodoxized himself and became an Anglican again or something like that. And then he started doing, you know, multi-religious stuff. But everything he did was spiritual. And he had essentially two modes. One was seraphic such as the song for Athene, which was popularized as Diana's funeral. And the other was horrible. <laughs> I mean, it was what he called the hellish realm. You know, it was just ugly and it was dissonant and screechy. And and he, he hit all of the, you know, buzzwords for instant popularity around the turn of the 21st century. His music was theoretically spiritual, I mean, and weirdly so, you know, sort of exotically spiritual. It was, it used period instruments, even though he was not of that period that used those instruments. He used them by preference and wrote for period instrument ensembles so they had something modern to play and play it they did. And and he liked like countertenors and weird eerie voice parts because they sound more spiritual, of course. And that was that was the whole point. Now, this modestly gifted guy wrote these enormously extended spiritual works. Uh, there's the last one he wrote, actually, the, the Veil of the Temple lasts seven hours. It's never been recorded in its entirety. There is an, an, a, a, an abridged version. I think it's on the Signum label. It's two and a bit hours, if you can even tolerate that. I mean, it's just bad music. It is so limited in expression and and unpleasant to listen to. I mean, from the point of view of like ultimate satisfaction or fulfillment, you know, five minutes of seraphic droopiness with a drone and a pretty little har harmonic pattern. I'm, just, I'm up for it just like anyone else is. But stretch it out to an hour and a half 
or an hour or anything like that. And no, no, no. I don't think that's going to be something that we're going to want to spend much time with. But what I find really fascinating about him is that since his passing, he's just vanished like a soap bubble. It's like, poof! I know that choirs still do the song for Athene and some of his short choral works, and they're very pretty, and that's perfectly fine. But the big stuff? Is anyone running around? doing this stuff. His most famous work was called The Protecting Veil. It was a cello concerto that was uh, written for Stephen Isserlis. It's about 45 minutes long, and it's for cello and strings, and it's excruciatingly dull, but quite listenable. I mean, it's nice. It's like the Goretzky Third Symphony or any of those sort of extended um, quasi, quasi-spiritual I don't know how, you know, incredibly, incredibly boring, but, you know, somehow, you know, mesmerizing pieces. And, you know, mind you, I mean, I love Morton Feldman. His stuff goes on for hours. But I find there that the material and the intent are, are perfectly synchronized. With, with John Tavener, I, I don't get any sense of, of, you know, what you call, you know, intelligent thought behind behind those issues, behind the music itself. That and the fact that, quite frankly, if the tall man from the music, music, the movie, the tall man from the movie Phantasm, you know, those horror movies, the creepy tall mortician, you know, were a composer, he would be John Tavener, because John Tavener kind of looked like him. You know, the first time I saw him, I thought, oh my God, it's Phantasm. It's like, no, it's a, he's a British composer, and he wrote, you know, music that would actually probably work well in a horror film. It's often is not. But I, I, I just have to show you, I, and I think it's just typical, uh, how, how messed up we are um, as a group of people who never really listen. We're interested in the idea of what these things are, not what they actually sound like. No one wants to take the time to actually listen and pay attention. And if you do, you just go, ugh, ugh, yeah. but they don't. So it doesn't matter. And, and I can prove it to you because this is actually a true story. Now, at ClassicsToday.com, we do sometimes April Fool's reviews. Sometimes we do April Fool's reviews when it's not April 1st. And I've done quite a few on this YouTube channel, as you might know. They're called Tinnitus Classics Reviews. There are some others as well. And we did, my, my beloved partner, um, David Vernier, business partner, I mean, you know, up in, up in Portland, Maine, is a, a brilliant choral conductor and composer, and, and he really knows his choral music. And, and as an April Fool's joke, he did a fake John Tavener review. And I am going to read the review to you. And I have to read it, and I can't show you the cover. We did a wonderful fake cover. You can go look at it on Classic Today, but I'll tell you why when it's over. It's really, really great. And it was so revealing about how nonsensical the whole, the whole mystical mythology surrounding this guy really was. So here is his review. The name of the work was God, Theos in Greek. We have the title in Greek. And it was a trilogy. And, and well, let me just read this to you. This is just, just absolutely marvelous. I was so enormously, enormously impressed by this. I wish I had written it myself, and I felt, you know, completely inadequate because I hadn't done it. But here it is. You ready? You can already hear the British press crying masterpiece over John Tavener's latest work, the first part of which has just been released by Chandos Records. It wasn't. It was a joke. All the fuss, including two-page, four-color advertising spreads in all the British magazines, which, according to the label, are, quote, the only ones with any influence in the world, unquote, is about Tavener's monumental, transforming trilogy, God. Theos. Part one, the mind of God, is the subject of this new recording, a marvelous and stupefying work for unknown countertenor, celebrity countertenor chorus, and untunable organ. The trilogy's 
other two parts, the eyes of God for full bore crumb horns and rooftop saxophone choir, and the meaning of God, featuring anonymous readings from ancient Greek scrolls set to music performed on specially milled Euphrates reeds, will be recorded, quote, in the fullness of time, unquote. For now, we have what amounts to a massive four-hour-long piece that essentially is a set of plain chant-sounding intonations, 77 in all, in each a solo melody consisting primarily of a single note, an F-sharp above middle C, to be exact, is sung by a countertenor who, either from sheer fatigue or by means of uh, some notational direction, adds an occasional squawking embellishment. The texts are completely indecipherable. Tavener apparently dictated them from sounds spoken in his ear in a vision. Underneath all of this is an incessant drone, here sung by what could only be called the greatest congregation of superstar countertenors ever assembled, identified for this occasion as the Clerks of Canterbury Countertenor Choir and Cantors of the Cotswolds. They're all here, from Andrea Scholl and Robin Blaze to David Daniels and Daniel Taylor, 41 countertenors in all, many culled from the ranks of the finest British and continental European early music ensembles. There's even a guy who sounds exactly like Alfred Deller. It may be Alfred Deller for all we know. But solo billing goes to 87-year-old Welsh countertenor Minis Tirith, who is literally making his singing debut with this recording. Tavener specifically chose Tirith, whom he discovered humming to himself in the loft of a West Country church six months prior to the recording session because he had found his voices, he had found his voices indeterminate or indeterminacy of pitch and unclassifiable tone color perfectly suited to represent God, a voice never before heard. The sparse accompaniment consists only of organ, but the composer is very clear to designate in the score that it must be untunable. No explanation is given. Although countless parish churches offered such instruments for the recording project, we've all got one of those, was the general comment. The one selected came from a 13th century monastery in eastern Slovakia that was destroyed by fire in 1248 and never rebuilt. The organ dug from the ruins and shipped to England for the recording is manned here by noted medieval untunable organ specialist Laszlo Meyer Thorne, who plays the instrument's only working key, which happens to be middle C, sort of. Tavener notes that along with the countertenor F sharp, this sets up, quote, a perfect tritonal relationship symbolic of the Holy Trinity, unquote. Each listener will have to decide whether he or she is up to four hours of intonations and drones in a mysterious, untranslatable language, no text or translations are included, accompanied by a penetrating, reedy-sounding organ playing a sort of middle C. Of course, fans of Tavener will have to have this, but the rest of us, but for the rest of us, it's worth t taking a more careful approach. In the four disc sets liner notes, Tavener, who begs not to be confused with eminent 16th century composer John Taverner, reveals some of his thoughts and motivations for this new work, spoken through two of God's three conductors, Tavener disciples Henry Pussel and Benjamin Bitten. Quote, well, yes, of course, many of you will want to wait for the work's world premiere, unquote, Pussel says, unquote again, which will take place during the next major televised funeral where billions of people are watching, unquote. As for the recording, Tavener's own words related by Bitten are telling, quote, my past musings and meditations on substance led to the concept of essence as the finite substance, if you will, of my compositions. Now, my most recent revelations have led to what I call ethero essence or ether sense the essence of the ethereal which is to say my music is moving closer and closer to the defining center of god which has no physical substance and therefore as i come closer to this point my music eventually will have no physical existence no measurable sound at all unquote. a moment if you will that many of us hope we live to experience 
So yes, there it was, God, Tevener's latest masterpiece. And we published this and we had a wonderful cover and, and you can go see it. If you are an insider member, there is a, an insider review category called We Only Wish. And if you go to the advanced search and look under insider review categories and choose We Only Wish, you will find a big list of our April Fool's reviews, including that one. And you'll see the wonderful cover art. And the reason I don't show it now is because originally we did. And what happened was we got a very um, hostile and somewhat quizzical note from someone at Chandos um, saying to us, would you please take that review down because our Japanese distributor saw it and ordered 12,000 copies <laughs> and we don't know what you're talking about. We don't know what this is. We never made this record because as you know, the classical music world is nothing if not humorless. And that was a real case in point. So I don't want to start the ball rolling again because even if I'm sitting here telling you exactly what we did and why we did it, no one's going to listen. They don't listen to me. They don't listen to the music. They don't listen to Taverner. They don't listen. They just say, ah, Taverner, God, he's popular. He was famous. We don't have that in our catalog. We must have it. Quick, order piles of it. That's what happened. And it was absolutely hilarious. I mean, it still is hilarious, but it just goes to show that what attracted people initially to Taverner's music, in my view, was not music. It wasn't the music at all. I mean, the song for Athena, yes, for five minutes, everybody loved it. Like they like, Al you know, the Allegri Miserere or the Albinoni Adagio or any, any one of those one-shot wonder composers. But then when you go and you, and you listen to like more of what they did, nobody has the time, nobody has the patience. All of those recordings that all of those labels made of all these big works by Taverner, where are they now? He simply disappeared. And frankly, I am not at all upset by that fact because I believe he deserves to disappear. I don't think there's much interest in what he did at all. In fact, I think a lot of it is just bad. And I think a lot of it is, however sincere he may have been personally, the issue is not whether he was he was serious or sincere. I mean, it doesn't take any effort to be serious and sincere. What it takes to write great music is talent, <laughs> just plain flaming talent and genius. And that, my friends, is the quality I find so singularly lacking in these unbelievably boring and repetitive pieces that happily seem to have disappeared along with their composer. And we'll see if that if that state of affairs continue, continues. Maybe people got tired of all of that spiritual muck. Maybe, maybe they found the authentic article in Bruckner. <laughs> yes, so we no longer need to worry about the fake ones. We've got the real thing. And that's maybe, that maybe explains part of his popularity too. But Taverner was, for my money, unquestionably one of the world's worst composers. And, and I am terribly sorry that he passed away and he was ill and all of that stuff. And I'm terribly glad that his music seems to be disappearing <laughs> along, with, along with, you know, the, the record industry that promoted it, that promoted all of that phony baloney stuff. So there you go. That's my opinion. You're entitled to yours. You may disagree, but you know, some of you, you know, wrote to me after the last one and you're like, oh, do you have to be negative? Do you have to say these things? The answer is yes, I do. I'm a critic. It's what I do. And frankly, you are a better critic for being honest about your likes or dislikes, your personal tastes, so that people listening to you can triangulate based on their own personal tastes. And if they don't like me or they don't like my taste, then they will not be deceived by anything I say or do. They will know to simply ignore me and go on to something else, which is also perfectly fine. But uh, go listen to Taverner instead if you think that's going to make your life a better thing. I, I tend to doubt that. So keep on listening, folks, to those other things, not to Mr. Taverner. Take care. <laughs>